What's up, boss? This is Abraham's wallet. We span the gap between the austerity of obedience to God and the prosperity rising from faithfulness. Run your home and your dough like a biblical boss. Good day, everyone. We at Abraham's Wallet want your year to be a pristine vintage. So we have started off this year by giving you some practical advice in the world of your physical capital. That is, we talked with Jeremy Boswell about what you eat on a day-to-day basis. Then Mark and Chris spoke about your physical capital and how you uh, will do well to lift some weights around, get some exercise. We're also going to touch on your intellectual capital today by reviving what's becoming a bit of an Abe's tradition, that is having Mark and Jeff sit down and discuss their favorite reads from 2022. So hopefully you'll find something that's inspiring to you, something you might want to grab, and maybe you'll get some warnings about things that you don't want to waste your time on. So without further ado, I'll throw it over to Mark and Jeff. Take it away, boys. Before we started recording, we were talking about whether we would do lightning round or more substantial discussions first. Do you remember where we ended on that? I, I think we ended on, I don't know, let's just give it a shot and see what happens. Okay. I, the book that I've really, that shaped my year was the novelization of Rambo, First Blood, Part 2. It was an old 1985 book that I found. Uh, is a, is a, it was a dusty copy, but it was a first edition. And this thing is powerful. If you enjoy that movie, you're really going to enjoy this novelization. A, a quick quote from it. Uh, this is when Rambo is being uh, electrocuted and, and tortured. And this is, this is the kind of prose you're in with Rambo, First Blood, Part 2, the novelization by David Morrell, 1985. I think Bantam paperback. His reaction was reflexive spasmodic, like a frog attached to electrodes as he had been attached to electrical wires that led back to a generator. Now, this is this guy's genius. He's comparing what Rambo's going through being electrocuted to what a frog would experience if he was being electrocuted. That's just the kind of Pulitzer Prize winning prose you're going to get in Rambo. First Blood Part Two, the novelization by David Morrell. Wow. Um, I think I we're don't done. Know that you've told it to me, but uh-huh. I'm glad that it's out there in case anyone wants to pick that up. Yeah, it, it, so, so I so think last year, last year I did Rocky Four, the novelization. The year before was Rocky Three, so I branched true. out a little this year. I think. Well, we're still in the Stallone wheelhouse, but what we're going to do is I'm just going to give a few a few titles that I read this year that I think people will like. But we're not going to spend too much time on them, and we'll go we'll go ping pong here. If you liked the book Endurance, which I think a lot of people have enjoyed, the story of the the endurance crash in Antarctica, you should read a book called Madhouse at the End of the Earth by Julian Sankton, and it is a story of another voyage to Antarctica where things didn't go as well. Um, but, uh, obviously somebody made it out because there's a story that was written. Uh, but if you liked endurance, this is one that I think a lot of people will, will enjoy. And you, you kind of unlike endurance where the whole time you're just going, how are these guys happy and optimistic and all doing so well? This one, you, you get some of those studs and you get some, as the title might suggest, crazy pants so madhouse at the end of the earth it's a fun read if you're into an adventure novel fantastic i love it here's my next uh my little quick hit it's a i don't like comic books i don't like graphic novels when somebody goes no you'll like this one i'm always i always roll my eyes but someone convinced me to i'd say read this graphic novel but there's not much to read it's called here by richard mcguire I can't hardly describe it except think of this. Think of a spot on the earth and every page is just another revelation of that spot on the earth through time. So sometimes you're seeing dinosaurs walk through and then sometimes it's, you know, years and years later, you're seeing a bit from a house that's been built on that spot. And it's always the exact same spot. It's uh, it, it has no story. It has no, I would even say not much more meaning to it aside from aren't we all vapors, but if you're looking for something that's just a creative 
uh, uh, creative hole to stick your head into for maybe 40 minutes sitting on the couch. This thing is it here by Richard McGuire. Wow. All right. Um, next 2034, a novel of the next world war. This is a fictional story that a guy who I know from high school recommended to me and he spends his time riding around the seas of Asia on on naval battleships. And he said, if it goes down, I wouldn't be surprised if this book is very close to how it goes down of a conflict that happens between the US and China that ends up involving nukes and there's a very interesting ending. Um, and I just thought this was a really fun, super fast read for global geopolitical fiction. That sounds fascinating. Okay, off of that, I'll go with one of my favorite books of the year, which was a nonfiction book called Gambling with Armageddon by Martin Sherwin. It is a. It is like the ultimate history of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which I'm always, I've always been fascinated by. It's the ultimate history of the Cuban Missile Crisis, but it doesn't just cover the Cuban Missile Crisis. It covers all of uh, the nuclear buildup and even uh, some of Oppenheimer and what was going on uh, with all of that leading up to it. But one of my favorite sections was this uh, hardly known story that during the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, tensions were high, Nobody knew what was going to happen. Is this going to be a World War III kind of thing? And there was a Soviet sub that was down near Cuba. These U.S. destroyers were dropping bombs around this sub, not to destroy it because that would have caused a war, but just to monkey with the guys and to get them to possibly surface. The U.S. guys had been told, don't do this. They're like, eh, we're going to do it anyway. Little did they know that this sub down beneath the surface of the water, it was the B-59 Foxtrot class sub from the Soviet Union, they were at their wits end. Their air conditioning had gone out days and days before. They had been underwater forever. The temperatures were like, it was like 104 degrees in the main areas. And then if you got closer to like the reactors and stuff, it was like 120 degrees. These guys were losing their ever loving minds. And the captain, they had been under so long, they didn't know if there was a world war or not. And so it's a little like Crimson Tide. They're way down under the water. And literally, this what the captain goes, you know what? We're firing the nukes. We're firing the nuclear torpedoes. And it was all he needed was himself and his political officer to press the button in a normal situation. But it just so happened that there was another guy on board. This guy named was Vasily Arkhipov. And Vasily Arkhipov had proved him, I'm going on and on here, but had proved himself really it. well years before on the K-19 incident, which was a Soviet sub had gone down. Uh, it, it went into nuclear meltdown. And this guy, Arkhipov, was on that ship and he helped save all these people. So Arkhipov is on this ship down, the Cuba Missile Crisis thing. And he was actually the Commodore of the whole flotilla. Strangely, he was also the second in command of this, of this, uh, the B-59. So you got three guys that had to say yes to fire the nuclear torpedo. The captain, the political officer, and Vasily Arkhipov. And Arkhipov, he said, guys, captain, you're losing your mind. We're all upset. We don't know what's going on. Do you really want to be the guy who pulls the trigger and there's not actually a war up there? Can we please just surface? And because of this guy, this man who's nobody knows this guy's name except hardcore history nerds, because of this guy, the captain went, all right, and they surfaced. And when they came up to the surface, the U.S. destroyer was there and they got to radio to Moscow and Moscow said, uh, get back home. And they went home. World War was avoided. There are some amazing stories that came out of the Cold War of people who like I think I've talked about it in a previous Best Books podcast, but Command and Control by Eric Schlosser hmm. is a history of nuclear near misses in the world. And there's some Russian not high-ranking dude that was ordered to fire the ICBMs um, back in the 80s, I think. And and he said no, mm -hmm. which normally you, he would have gotten his brains blown out by the officer standing next to him. But he said no, and they waited an extra minute or two and realized it was a weather issue that was looking like they had incoming nukes from the U.S. So I feel like these types of people should have statues in every city in the world. 
Uh, yes. Well, this book is called Gambling with Armageddon, and it's a fine title, but as a believer, I couldn't help but read all the near misses and everything and go, clearly God's hand was in this, going, yes. okay, we're not gonna we're not gonna let the world go just yet. We're gonna let them we're gonna scare the poo out of them, but we're not gonna let it all go just yet. Yeah, that's good. It's a great book. Um, I, it's a fascinating, fun historical read. I, I couldn't more highly recommend it. Well, my next one is a double. I I wanted to, you know, I run with a very diverse mix of people when it comes to theological views and things like that. Um, and I wanted to get a lot of people talk about this book, Strange Fire by John MacArthur. Uh, some people hate it and some people love it. It's basically his treatise on why the gifts of the spirit have stopped they have ceased hmm. um and i i paired it with this one which is called authentic fire um by michael brown dr michael brown um and this uh, michael brown's book is a response to john MacArthur's book um and i'll say i had strong reactions to the MacArthur book. I thought he effectively took caricatures by looking at things like Benny Hinn meetings and tried to say, well, obviously these people are nuts. And so this is all a bunch of hogwash. And uh, I, I found it immensely unconvincing and academically dishonest. Um, and just overall, I would I don't know if I would call it a heaping pile of garbage, but it's definitely not not uh, very good work. Um, let, let me Brown's ask this book. real quick, Mark, on, on the MacArthur one, because I've been interested in this whole, I guess it's the cessationist uh, mm -hmm. idea, right? I, I've been interested in learning why do people believe that? Because it seems like you would have to do some theological gymnastics to get to that. Do you feel like reading that book would give you a good sense of, yes, this is why someone might possibly, this is the reasoning that they would take. Is, is this well, the authority on that? I have friends that would, would kind of take that cessationist position. And part of my motivation in reading the book was, let me, let me get to a, oh, okay, I don't agree, but I understand. Mm -hmm. It pushed me the other way pretty hard. Um, <laughs> okay. and, and I think, I, I wish I had done my homework to, to give you some examples. I think there's probably books that do a better job of saying, here are the specific passages that are referenced by continuationists, those who would say the gifts continue. Hmm. Um, and here's how we interpret them. This was not that. This was mostly just describing kind of out of control meetings and events and things like that. And then um, using that to say, thus, it's all a bunch of malarkey. The Michael Brown book, I thought, was much, much more uh, precise in the fact that it, it did some of the same types of things where it took his personal experiences. Um, but I, I, I think Michael Brown was smart enough to go, well, you could just say I'm crazy. So let's actually look at the text mm -hmm. yeah. and see what it says. And Michael Brown is a scholar of uh, ancient Hebrew and one of the world's foremost uh, experts on biblical languages. So he was able to really uh, smartly speak to this is what these passages mean. This is, you know, what, what the New Testament passages mean. Um, and I found his book not to be some sort of academic, really thick read. It was also a very quick read, but, uh, it was it was helpful to read those two side by side. Nice. Uh, I'll go with a theological type book. Um, last time, well, I, th I think last year we talked about, I mean, he picked apart a little uh, on your end, um, Dane Ortland's book. What was it? Gentle and Lowly. Gentle and Lowly. Yeah. And off that, I read it and I actually really liked it. But <laughs> I found his next book much better. It was called, it's called Deeper. And I, look, I, I don't know nothing about this guy. All I know is that I felt like this deeper book was incredibly spot on. And he has a chapter, uh, I want to say it's chapter five. And it is, uh, yeah, chapter five, and it's called Acquittal. And he goes through, here's what justification means. Here's what sanctification means. Here's what justification by sanctification means, which all sounds really heady. 
what I love about this is those are terms that I've heard for years and years, had a general vague notion of, but he made it so understandable. Chapter five is worth the price of admission. I thought it was fantastic. I loved every bit of it. He's this guy who, who will, again, this is a good way to turn someone off from a book. He will quote old Puritan writers, but he does it in a way that's actually readable. And you, you, it, it helps ground a lot. I mean, obviously his stuff is grounded in scripture, but it's also grounded in these deep theological thinkers from uh, eons ago. That, that's, a, that's a winning recipe for me. Old, old Puritan writers generally a good addition to your book. He's got um, a lot. Sweet. My last one, I've been on kind of an eschatology kick and tried to work through a few books a year on what the heck does revelation mean uh, and some of the, the prophecies uh, in Daniel and all the end time stuff. Um, last year, I read Doug Wilson's When the Man Comes Around. Ooh. Um, I just love Doug Wilson's writing style, but... I will say by the end of this book, I was a little distraught thinking, oh, his arguments are so compelling. I think I, 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 it seems like he's right. And then I talked to people who told me, well, you know, everything hinges on a few things that are very unlikely to be true. Basically, this book takes and explores the preterist view that most of Revelation describes what happened in AD 70. Um, and it's extremely convincing unless you believe that the book of revelation was written in like AD 88, um, then it's mm. very impossible to interpret it that way. So um, this to me, you can have whatever position you want, uh, but it was a, it was an interesting read to understand another position there. And, you know, Doug Wilson is snarky and fun, even when he's talking about something as potentially dry as eschatology. Okay. Now Mark, you said your last one, you meant the last, the lightning rounds. That's my last lightning round. Uh, okay, I'll do one last lightning round. Um, Death in the City by Francis Schaeffer. I've always loved uh, Francis Schaeffer, but if you've tried to read much Francis Schaeffer, especially his his kind of profound his his primary trilogy, uh, uh, the God who is there, he is not silent. Um, I forget the third one. Uh, they are hard reads. Gosh, they're hard yeah. reads. You feel like you have got to know. You you feel like you have at least had to have an undergraduate degree in philosophy, but uh, let alone a, a graduate degree. Death in the City is a small little volume, and it I feel like it's a compendium of all of that, and it makes it really digestible. It's it's a dark view of the world, which I think is accurate, especially for this time. Um, I'll read you one line, one, one quote from it. Often Christians, young and old alike, have not faced the facts about their own countries, the United States. And by the way, I think this was written in like 1977, that they are under the judgment of God. Perhaps that explains why they are often without enthusiasm in their proclamation of the gospel, why they just give the crumbling wall a coat of paint. So he takes the Jeremiah view of like the United States and goes, we're under judgment, y'all. We're under judgment. And he talks about the philosophical reasons of how we got here. And typical Schaefer, he's also very wide and generous and, you know, empathetic towards humans. Like that's one of my favorite things about this guy. He was such a a hard charging pound the table kind of guy. But when it came to lost people, his heart was just always, always, always broken. Um, I found Death in the City to be a, a perfect compendium of all of his thoughts. If this is the only Schaefer book you get to read, I would encourage it to be this one. Awesome. Um, well, that was the lightning round. Should we move on to the, to the meat now that we've had our potatoes? Sure. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to I, I, I'm gonna drive the ship here. We're going to talk about The Every. We're going to talk about a book that I enjoyed and you did not. The Every. Let's do it. By Dave Eggers. The reason I read it is because, man, the, the inside jacket description sounded super interesting to me. So why don't you explain? It's a sequel to a book called The Circle that Dave Eggers wrote. I'm a big Dave Eggers fan. Didn't find The Circle all that compelling. The Circle was uh, was basically a, uh, a description of someone. And the, by the way, they made it into a terrible movie with Tom Hanks. Um, it's it's about a company, a, a Google type company, and how it starts to take over. Well, the Every is the sequel. I find it. I found it much better. And the gist of this one is that little company, the circle has now turned into a company called the every, and they cover it all. They, it's, they buy Amazon. They, they own all the devices every, so they take every tech 
uh, every tech company you can think of with power and they own it. And Eggers, if you read interviews with Eggers, he's basically going, look, y'all, we have all lost our ever loving minds. We have allowed technology to take over everything. And he makes, a very, I think, a very convincing argument. We have allowed microphones in our homes and act like, eh, oh, well, it's okay. Eggers is a guy who goes, I, I write lots of books. He says, I don't have Wi-Fi on my computer. How can I get anything done if I have access to all of the internet? Anyway, it's a narrative story. It's a story. It's a fictionalized story. What could go wrong with this kind of thing? Taking over, taking over, taking over, take, uh, and it's all through the viewpoint of an employee at the Every. I don't know why. Uh, if someone didn't like the writing style, okay. If you didn't like the structure, okay. I, I can't imagine, Mark, why you'd be so anti the Every. Um, I found that when I was reading it, it just felt so on the nose. Like it didn't feel like I was reading a futuristic, not even a near futuristic account of what, what was going to happen if we continued down the path. It's like when I held up that book 2034 and it's, it's happens in, in 10 years from now, um, that was fine because we're talking about in the near future and well, if these three dominoes fall, then this could happen. It, imagine if that book had been like, well, if Russia and Ukraine ever get into a tussle, then here is the sequence of events that is unstoppably going to be marched toward. That's how I felt when I was reading the every is it was like, well, no, everything you're describing here is already entirely true. All of it, like social capital tech companies with these people who don't understand what the real world is like and they're the ones who are making all these decisions i mean it's interesting that twitter kind of had its dramatic change in since i read that book but you know when you read just the day-to-day -day lives of employees at facebook twitter amazon google it sounds a lot like exactly what he wrote in that book and i thought it was super stressful and thought i don't want to hang out with these people anymore that's okay, I, I, like I, I think that's fair, but I, I, but don't you think? Okay, so it's not some future thing. It's going. Look, this is a. I think you could say a a slightly characterized, uh, caricaturized version of what's really going on. But the things he would he would bring up, like I, I, I think Eggers is probably a self uh, proclaimed liberal human being. But I thought any liberal reading this book would go, we're terrible. We, what we are doing as far as speech and as far as cancel culture, as far as this person can't say this, I thought it was just this screed against all that was going on, especially when it comes to uh, social interactions and language and how w w you know the people who used to be the, the champions of free speech have become the very enemy of that. Yeah. No, I I can totally get behind the book on a philosophical level. I just didn't really enjoy reading it. And Eggers, he writes as if it's a Bill Simmons column. Like, there's not a whole lot of literary no. uh, finesse to his writing. Mm -hmm. I just, I feel like I'm eating Lucky Charms after stepping away from a Michelin three star when I was reading, you know, uh, Cormac McCarthy or somebody that I prefer their style a bit more as uh, in eggers defense i or uh, slight defense i will agree with you the circle and the every are not his best written books um but i i enjoy his writing style especially when it comes to my favorite book of his which is called you shall know our velocity okay sweet um that's the every i think i'm gonna change gears dramatically i mean it's probably relevant to what we were just talking about but this book, let's see when it was initially written, 1656, um, before paper. John Owen's The Mortification of Sin, mm -hmm. and it was translated into modern English, so I've never tried to read the original text. Aaron mm -hmm. Wren, the guy who writes the Masculinist blog, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, he's even been a guest on this podcast. Um this book was translated into readable English and slightly reorganized to make more sense by Aaron Wren. And I just thought it was awesome. Huh. Um, the, 
the thesis is that the job of every believer is to be killing sin constantly in their lives. And, you know, I was listening to Doug Wilson's podcast yesterday, and he even talked about this book. And he said, there's the initial regeneration that occurs in the life of a believer when they turn to Christ. And then there's the massive landscaping projects that happen when you've maybe left the garden and there's weeds up to your neck when you come back in. And that takes Mm -hmm. some deep work. And then there's the type of gardening that a good gardener has to do every single day and pick all the weeds that are the size of their thumbnail. Um, And that that job is just, it's never done uh, of killing sin and, and rooting sin out in our lives. And this book in a very Puritan way, just goes after um, what that would look like. And it's it was foreign to me. Nobody had ever been like, hey, this is a part of what you need to be about as a follower of Christ. I mean, he says, hating sin as sin, not just because it is causing us personal problems um, and a sense of Christ's love for us on the cross are at the heart of all true killing of sin. The fact that you're so selective in the particular sins you strive to defeat says plainly that the reason is because they are the only ones that are causing you pain and trouble. If they weren't, you probably wouldn't be worried about them. Um, And so he really goes after kind of how much we are comfortable tolerating sin and how little we go roaming through the jungles of our soul looking for the sins that might have gotten away. Um, and I didn't find it condemning. Like I didn't think at the yeah. end I had just read a Jonathan Edwards sermon. I thought, man, this was actually really encouraging. So I I admonish anyone to read that book. Mark, let's 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 do a, a quick halftime. Uh, I don't know if it's halftime or not, but let's take a little let's take a little rabbit trail. So you a word great. from our sponsors. A word from our sponsor. Uh, it's brought, this this uh, half of the show is brought to you by J.C. Penny. I. I don't think I can say it. Mark, um, <laughs> you mentioned, because you've talked a lot about reading, and you mentioned I was listening to Doug Wilson's podcast the other day. So I, I'm curious, I think I think the beloved listeners would like to know, there's a they, lot of guys out them. there who are going, I, I don't have time to read. I don't have time to listen to podcasts. Sometimes I, I hear other people talking about the amount of things that they consume. And so my question for you, I'm not looking for some sort of law or guidance. I'm just curious, when do you read... And when do you listen to podcasts? Yeah, so I read before I go to bed at night, almost exclusively. Like I how read, much time? I read the Bible in the morning, generally. Um, didn't make I, your I list, even, by the way. I just wanted to point that out. Huh? It didn't make your list. I just wanted to point that out. That in the morning. And sometimes, like, if I'm studying something or this John Owen book, I might even include a page or two of that in, in the morning time. Mm. But when I'm reading certainly fiction, or I just finished a book on Payne Stewart, uh, the golfer. And that would be like nonfiction that it's just pleasure and stuff like that, that I'm going to read before I go to bed. And I don't have a set amount of time. Sometimes it's two hours and sometimes it's one page because I get sleepy. I hope to read less books this year than I did last. It, that usually means I'm having a good good time falling asleep. <laughs> uh-huh. um, but yeah, that's kind of my, my schedule. And I try not to get too antsy about I need to finish a book in a certain amount of time. Do you read one at a time? Generally, yeah. Hmm. Or I might have, I, like I might do, if I'm doing a fiction, I just started a book right now that's like 850 pages and I'm, I might start something else while I'm doing that just because that's that's going to be a long time to just be in one book. But we'll see. And podcasts, is there a when you're working out, when you're driving? Yeah, it depends. I mean, this morning I bench pressed while I listened to Bill Simmons discuss who, who was the likely MV, or first team all NBA candidates for uh, mm-hmm. the East. Um, I don't. I don't comprehend podcasts as well unless I'm driving or something where I can really just focus on that. So I'll occasionally have podcasts on in the background while I'm working, but it, I usually then realize I didn't hear any of it. <laughs> so like Joe Rogan, 
I, I'll listen to him in the background because his podcasts are like three hours. Um, but I, I rarely sit down and just listen to that for three hours. If I have chores to do around the house, I usually will stick some earbuds in if I'm by myself and listen to podcasts. Like I actually really enjoy cleaning up the house and, and listen to a good podcast after mm. the kids go to bed. If, if my wife's not around or something like that. Okay. All right. Great. What about you, Jeff? Give us the quick. I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I travel a lot for work and so I'll read on planes. I'll read in airports. Uh, I try to read before bed. Um, I wish I was a little more disciplined about that. I think sometimes we just need to go upstairs and, and spend more time reading than just like, Oh, let's be downstairs and not, uh, I, my, my big struggle right now is I have way too many books at the same time. I, I, I think I literally have like eight books right now and I, and it doesn't do well in my brain. My brain just, my brain feels, I know I shouldn't feel this, but I'll admit I do. I feel this like, oh my gosh, I haven't finished that. Oh, and you're midway through this one. You're never going to finish that one. And it's just this constant toggling and, and I, I'm like an addict because I'll go, oh, but here's another book I could just start. And I, I, maybe I'll listen to that one when I'm running. And then it, so it, it's, uh, it's yeah. not good habits and it's probably something I need to break. Yeah. Do you always finish a book when you start it? Uh, nine times out of 10, yes. Uh, it, I, will, I will bail on it. If, if I'm going to bail on it, I will bail on it early. Yeah, I think I, I, there's books that... I either am so excited to get to the end because they've been a slog. I uh, I would put one of the books I read last year was For Whom the Bell Tolls. And man, that was hard That's to get one. through. Yes. I did not enjoy it. But I felt like I needed to read it because, you know, classic. Um, and then there's books that I sort of dread the end coming because I'm just enjoying hanging out with the the writer so much that I want to. I want it to keep going, but Chuck Klosterman always said that he said, I, maybe you're, you're saying the opposite, but Klosterman said, you've never read a book that was too short. And I actually, I think I agree with that. It's rarely have I ever felt like what it's over. I've kind of felt like, you know what, that was the, that was either the right amount or that was just a lot of, especially nonfiction books. Somehow we got in our head that nonfiction books need to be at least this long to be worth the price of admission. And I don't know, I think there's a space for, there's a space for 90 page books that are just great and dense and you got it and you move on, but nobody's yeah. willing to write those books. All right, let's move on to the second half. All right. Um, probably in terms of just pure enjoyment, I am going to call this one, which is The Lincoln Highway by Amor Towles. Uh, I think Amor Towles is the guy in our in our time for fiction writing. I don't know. Um, I'm sure I don't read as as many of the candidates as you might, but uh, I just everything he's written I have enjoyed. So, Gentleman in Moscow, we did a whole podcast on that book. It it ranks in certainly the top ten. Uh, period. Top 10 books I've ever read. Wow. Um, this one is not as good as A Gentleman in Moscow, but it was still really good. And it's just the story of a, a couple guys in the 1950s kind of making their way across America, getting into some shenanigans, then getting into some real hot water. And, you know, because I think you're still halfway through this one, Jeff, I'm not going to tell you if they get out of their hot water, if they end the book in pools of blood, but... Um, something happens Gross. okay well good so i really liked it um and i thought i i just he's one of I, I think he's a lot like steinbeck uh where i just never pick up something that Amortals or john steinbeck has written and go well that was a waste of my time so mm. So I'll go to my, my next one. And it's a book that I don't know that y'all have talked about on the podcast. Uh, if there's a reason for it, I'd be curious why. But I read The Inter Intentional Father by John Tyson. And it's a, it's a small little volume. And there's got to be a reason y'all aren't talking about it because it feels so in line with everything you guys talk about in terms of being a dad. Now, granted, the book is designed uh, to talk to fathers of sons. I don't have sons. I found it highly applicable. I have two little girls. 
this book challenged the heck out of me to um, not not be a dad who just who's responsive, but who's thinking, I got a kid. And he says, you got a kid who's leaving and probably at 18 to go off to do something. Now, hopefully he comes back and builds up the family, but whatever. He's kind of leaving your world for a little bit. What have you, and he will have a suitcase with him or a backpack. What have you put in that backpack in terms of skills, practical skills, spiritual insights, stories from the family? And I mean, what Tyson did with his son when he turned 13, from 13 to 18, you go, but that's a full time job. And I think Tyson's going, but what else matters? It is an incredibly uh, dense little book. But incredibly challenging. Uh, boy, I've overused that adverb. Um, it, uh, it 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 was. It's powerful. It's really powerful book. No, yeah, that's great. I uh, I got to spend time in 2022 with John Tyson, kind of going through his thinking when he was writing the book. And um, yeah, I he's actually doing one for daughters um, that's going to come out. Mm-hmm. But if if it hasn't already, um, but yeah, I it hasn't been intentionally excluded from the Abraham's wallet podcast. Yeah. I think it's a good, good thing to put on people's radar. There's nothing y'all would read in that and go, I don't know what to do with it. Everything you, you guys would read in this. You'd go, yes, yes. That is, that is what we are doing. That is what we are trying. It's a great compendium of, of the skills and training. And again, like I said, spiritual guidance that you want your kid to have by the time they're 18. Awesome. Um, okay, I'll do a spiritual book. This one was was a long one, but have you read Healing Through Deliverance by Peter Horobin? No, I haven't. Well, if you've ever have you ever done it's a dictionary? Like, Good night. Critic- this one, I mean, it's the same as the Lincoln Highway. Yeah, but okay. There's no pool of blood in that second one. Yeah. Well, huh. Uh I, have you done critical skills? The class I've done the, a couple okay. of times. About to go through it, I think, for the third time. Steven swears he has never read this book. Liar! But, we know he's a liar. We know he got everything from that book. But verbatim, there's so <laughs> many things in this book that come out of critical skills, and I'm not making accusations here. I'm actually, it's cool to me that mm-hmm. people who have been doing ministry and want to start exploring what does what is deliverance ministry? Where are there places in the, like I approach this as somebody who is a big believer in de- deliverance ministry as like a way that people can get free, experience more fullness in Christ. And I think there's a lot of nutbags in the world of deliverance ministry uh, who need to be avoided and brought back into alignment with what the Bible actually says. Hmm. And so this book I thought was an excellent resource for kind of going start to finish in what kinds of health consequences do we see when there's spiritual junk bothering somebody? How do we deal with the question of, is this spiritual or is this physical or is just bad luck? Um, Like, how do we navigate that? What are the right ways to pray for somebody? What does it look like when a demon manifests itself? Um, And he's got a lot of stories as well as a ton of scripture and it's, it's just a really, if you could only read one book on kind of the spiritual realm and if you're interested in like, what does it look like to have demons, like spiritual warfare, deliverance, all that stuff. I think this guy from, from my read, highly trustworthy. Um, I think it's a good book that, that covers really all the bases. So what's it called again? Healing Through Deliverance, Peter right. Horvin. Okay. Um, excellent book. All right. My next one is a book. This sounds strange. I try to, there's a few books I try to read every year. Uh, I I just read it again and again. C.S. Lewis said we read the same books, not because they change, but because we do. Oh, the Um, places you will go. Is that what it is? Oh gosh. It just, it just, it just hits me right here. Cause I, cause it rhymes. Uh, my book, I had a few on this, on my reread list, but the one I want to touch on is, uh, Kazuo Ishiguro's. The Remains of the Day. Kazuo Ishiguro was a uh, Japanese author. He was born in Japan, but actually raised in England. And you may have seen the the uh, Anthony Hopkins and Emma Thompson movie, The Remains of the Day, which is an excellent movie. 
I love this little book. It's all about a butler who works for uh, a, a very uh, well-heeled uh, man, a duke or whatever, in England at the onset of World War II. And Stevens, the butler, is blindly devoted to this man, even though this man is making all sorts of bad decisions. And he is acting, his, his boss is acting as a conduit for the Nazis so that they can, uh, so that, so that the English will have some sort of appeasement. And the guy does it not knowing what he's doing. He just thinks he's doing it for the good of England, for the good of Germany, but it's a study of the Butler and how he's closed himself off from his own life, from emotions, even from romance with this, uh, with the housekeeper who works there. It is it, in the way, uh, Ishiguro writes from the Butler's standpoint is so powerful. I think the, the ending always moves me. It, I know where it's, I know it, it's coming. It always moves me to tears at the very end. It's a very sad book in the, in the, in the way that this man has effectively wasted so much of his life. And yet there's some hope that in the remains of the day, what remains of the day, maybe he can change things. Wow. I always, if there's Steinbeck that I haven't read, it's always going to be on the list. And this one is Cannery Row. Have you read Cannery Row? I have not. I think it was one of the most fun that I've ever read. And it's got some of those elements of like Grapes of Wrath or East of Eden where there's tragic sort of drunken bad decisions that get the whole gang into trouble. Hmm. But there's a layer of everything's going to be okay. That's not quite true in those heavier books. If you want to hang out with Steinbeck and his cast of characters and the Chinese shop owner and the rich reclusive scientist and the drunk day laborers, this is kind of a a fun book. Uh, I recommend it. Well, it's interesting because one of my New Year's resolutions for 2023 was to was read as many books about industrial canning as I could. So this is, uh, this is, this seems to be a layup. My, my next book, uh, and I'll end, this will be my last one. You, whatever you got, we'll, we'll go with yours. I, I am fascinated by the French resistance. Uh, I think it is such a metaphor for what we as believers are doing. Uh, the French resistance was that small group of people in France during World War II who tried to buck the system and cause sabotage and all these things to go down to take the Nazis down. And there's a, a little book by uh, Paul Kicks called The Saboteur. And let me, let me just give you the let me give you the outline of this book. It's all about this guy named Robert de la Rochefoucauld. And Robert de la Rochefoucauld was from French nobility and aristocracy. This guy had every reason to go, I got enough money. Y'all handle this war while the Nazis come in. I'm going off to England. I'm going off to America. I'm out of here. But he didn't. He went, you know what? I may have a lot of stuff. We may have a castle. These Nazis are not taking over my country. I am going to I am going to go down fighting. And so he went off to Scotland, got trained in hand-to-hand combat, knives, parachute jumping, all this, parachuted into France. And I mean, all the sabotage this guy did was it, it, every time it like it feels like a great scene from a movie, great scene from a movie, great scene from a movie. There's there's a moment where he's been captured by the Germans, he's going to be killed. He's got to shoot his way out. Of a, of a German controlled prison, goes down the street. They're all looking for him. He goes into this house and the sister is actually a nun. He wears her nun outfit to get out of the town. It's story after story like this. It's uh, uh, cramming explosives into a baguette, pretending to be a worker, going into a factory, probably cannery row type factory, goes into a factory and plants the bread goes away an hour later, it blows up this munitions plant. It's story after story like this, all about a guy who had every right to go, this isn't my fight. And he went, like heck it isn't, I'm going to fight all the way through. That's awesome. What's the title? The Saboteur by Paul Kicks. Okay, I I am going to have to order that right as we speak. If I can figure out how to spell saboteur. S a b o t e u r. I I do a little teaching at a church here, and I d- I built a whole talk off of that book and how Paul we Kicks, are meant to be K i x K i x. We are meant to be uh, saboteurs in the kingdom, taking down uh, everything that the enemy is trying to. Trying oh, to that's awesome! I'm going to be ordering the final 
hardcover copy oh. available on Amazon. Unbelievable. Well, everyone's heard me, so they, they must have rushed out to buy this out. It's an it's an older book. It's not exactly a new book. It's no. a few years old. Um, sidebar, since I jumped on Amazon while we were talking here, do you know if you're going to buy books from Amazon, which I don't necessarily think you should, but you can, I sometimes do, um, if you click the little more buying options, you can buy any book you want in a hardcover, usually if it's if it's older, like more than a year or two old, for like four bucks uh, from other sellers. And you just scroll down until you find one that's at least like very good condition. And I, I mean, I got two books the other day that were each over 800 pages, hardcover copies, great shape. My total spend was eight dollars after tax. So, well, I, I'll 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 take it a little different direction. What I love is betterworldbooks.com. Better World Books. It's the same thing. They they've just got some storehouse or whatever. They they've got all these old and it's dirty, dirty cheap to get to get a bunch of books. So I I, I want to feed Amazon as little as possible. Better World Books. Love them. I think they donate books when you buy books. Free shipping. It's a wonderful website. It works really well, and they've got about everything you could need. Yeah. Um, Brought to you sell- by BetterWorldBooks.com. They're selling on Better World Books. You can buy the Saboteur for five dollars and thirty nine cents. There you go. So for so $12, rush right out. Twelve dollars and ninety eight cents on Amazon. Now I wonder if my books on Better World Books. Are- Ooh, we could check that right now. No, let's not. Let's go to let's go to your books. Let's 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 finish things up. All right. Um, the last one I wanted to mention is one that I think a lot of people have kind of gotten into as a result of the the wildness in our world in the past three years. I had a lot of people telling the reason I decided to dive into this series was because I think I kept seeing on Twitter people who I like what they have to say and follow. They kept saying dude, what's happening in the world right now is basically just the exact same thing from That Hideous Strength by C.S. Lewis. So that's the book I'm talking about, That Hideous Strength by C.S. Lewis. It's the third in his Space Trilogy. and um, Which, by the way, it should never be called the Space Trilogy. The first two books take place in space. I read the first two books this last year, Out of the Silent Planet, Paralandra. This book does not take place in space. No, it one. takes place on Earth. Yeah. Except at the last two pages, you find out. Oh, that no, 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 I'm no, just no. kidding. I know that you're in the middle of this one, so there will be yeah. no spoilers. But um, yeah, I loved Out of the Silent Planet and Perlandria. Um, I think that this one is so much more chewy. It's like you got to just think and work your way through it. It is not the same pace as those other two books. Um, but the reward is there. And I agree that it kind of describes a world in which, you know, there's a, there's a distinct undercurrent trying to take you like, you will think this way, please. You will think this way. Don't, don't worry about resisting us. Um, and CS Lewis does a really good job of illustrating how that is not being motivated by the the government or the actors that you think it's being motivated by, there's something darker and bigger behind all of it. And I think, you know, if you wanted to draw parallels to what's happening in in the world right now, it wouldn't be too hard to do. So Mark, uh, do you think someone could pick this up and get it without having read the other two? You could, you could certainly get a lot of it. I think that you'd miss out on, who the characters are because there's a giant time gap in between books one and two and book three. Mm -hmm. Um, You've got characters who are young kind of action heroes in books one and two, really the main character who is the old wise man in book three. Um, So you could definitely do it. I just, um, why would you? Because in terms of pure joy, book one was my favorite to read. Um, <sighs> Mark, there so. is a section in book two. I, cause I, I, I was in this the last year and I did that one as an audio book. There's a section in book two where the gist of it is this planet Paralandra has not fallen yet. There has not been a, a, a fall, uh, not autumn. I just mean like the fall of mankind. 
And there's a moment where the Satan character is trying to tempt the Eve character. And what we get in the Bible is about a, a, a like a four line conversation. And Lewis goes, what if that, what if I wrote, you know, in audio book terms, I think it was like a 20 minute conversation. And it, it, the temptations that are coming to Eve, you're listening to the, you're listening to the lens of the Eve, listening to the lens, you're listening to it as if you, you were Eve, the Eve character. And you're going, that does sound convincing. That does yeah. like, yeah, why wouldn't I? Maybe God does want me to rebel. Maybe that's actually his master plan. Oh my word, that section right there just baked my noodle in every good way. Yeah. And he does it in a different planet, which avoids the, the, trap of hey let me tell you a story that really will expand your view on what happened in the bible he's not yeah. trying to just to be right. clear if you haven't read it it's not a retelling of eve mm-hmm. but it is it is an example of what would a different world that hadn't yet fallen look like if there was this battle between you know sin and and righteousness happening there for the first time so and it um, really and and i think what takes you into book 3 is spiritual warfare like that is the that is the undercurrent of all three books that each planet has this demonic presence that is trying to force its will against god's greater will and it happens on venus it happens on mars that so book one is venus book two is mars and then book three it's all it's the showdown on earth so in that in that terms i guess if you lived on jupiter you would call this the space trilogy yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's really written from the perspective of a, a ghost-like being that can survive on the gaseous, non-solid <laughs> surface of Jupiter. Yeah, um, like some of your listeners. The, what? What? I don't know. Did you just come on the Abraham's Wallet podcast and try to insult our listeners? Honey, we're moving Jeff's book to shelf three. <laughs> um, no, Jeff is not insulting you listeners. He... Uh, he is one of you, really. And, That's right. And he's very thankful to have been a guest on the Abraham's Wallet podcast <laughs> uh, and hopes to be invited back. So it couldn't be more true, Mark. Thanks for thanks for bringing me on. I feel like I, uh, I I'm like I'm like Schneider on one day at a time. Like I'm I'm over at the Abraham's Wallet apartment a little too often, but I always appreciate being able to come over. Hey, man! I think that the people enjoy having your witty uh thoughts uh on on books and i'm thankful that there's someone in my life unlike my usual podcast partner who reads a lot of books that can can bring something to this conversation each year so does he not read a lot i thought he read a lot. Uh, i don't think steven is a big book reader i think he has certainly given me a lot of books that have been very impactful in my life so he's not a non-reader but yeah. i i'm not sure that he's cranking through fiction and nonfiction and all the different categories at the level that you are. And that I, I, I think he's to. mostly reading compendiums of uh, Hagar, the horrible car- karmic strips. I think that's what he means. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't, that joke might have landed if I was born back in the Cuban missile crisis era like you, but I don't think I got it. Hooray. We end on an insult folks. <laughs> Love you, Jeff. Have Love a good you, one. Mark. Bye. Read hard. Bye.